section nineteen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter sixteen the captain's return boats approach the fort assailed on all sides hot fire passing the fort archy wounded the landing fort attacked needham hauls down the flag enemy put to flight the pursuit fall of commander babacombe prisoners captured fort destroyed re-embark passage down the river sail for jamaica death of commander babacombe funeral murray promoted hastens to st david's alec murray felt the full responsibility of the duty imposed on him but he knew that he had trustworthy supporters in jack and terence and that full reliance could be placed on the military officers and all the gallant marines and soldiers of the regiment as soon as day broke higson dropped down the stream to rejoin the main body he had heard the shouts and cries and fancying that they had been caused by the appearance of another puma or jaguar in the camp he had not thought it his duty to quit his post as soon as he arrived murray informing him of what had happened ordered him to proceed down the river and ascertain if possible what had become of the captain and the two unfortunate gentlemen who had been carried away by the current in the meantime every preparation was made for starting the soldiers had re-embarked the expedition was about to proceed when two boats were seen rounding a point some way down the river the seamen cheered heartily when they discovered that their captain's gig was taking the lead she having at length got near terence who was looking out with great satisfaction saw that his old shipmate ben snatchblock was on board as the gig came up alongside he inquired for the consul and his friend they are lost answered the captain not a trace could we discover of them they must both poor fellows have been drowned before they had been many minutes in the water and this brave fellow here was nearly lost also in his attempt to save them i cannot bear to think of their sad fate while we shall much miss their assistance we have however an unexpected addition to our force i had gone some way down when i saw a fire on the shore and putting in found commander babacombe and his boat's crew encamped he having recovered sufficiently to enable him to come up and join us how was snatchblock saved asked terence by catching hold of a big tree which rose out of the water when i was pretty nigh done for answered ben thanks also to commander babacombe and his boat's crew who hearing my shouts came and took me off the corvette's gig with her perspiring commander as terence called him soon afterwards came up he was full of fight and valour and burning with eagerness as he said to have a brush with the enemy he looked but little able to undergo any exertion and captain hemming who thought him unfit for the work regretted that he had joined the expedition though he complimented him on his zeal and determination i couldn't bear the thought of being left behind and though i knew that i should be reduced to a pancake and bitten into one mass of blisters i determined to follow you he answered but it has been trying work i can assure you i have lost three stone already so dick spurling my coxswain who is a good judge of weight declares and i have made him hoist me up on his back every morning to try and then those abominably greedy mosquitoes i should have thought after feasting on the hides of two hundred fellows or more they might have had the conscience to let me alone the gluttons i had to tell the men off in two watches to wave branches over me at night or there wouldn't have been an ounce of blood left in the morning even if they hadn't carried me off bodily and really considering the size of their wings and the strength of their proboscises i thought that more than probable now after all i have gone through i only hope that the enemy will hold out and give us something to do as captain hemming was unwilling to displace murray 
he directed the sorely tried commander to take charge of the heavier boats while he and the lieutenant proceeded on ahead with the lighter ones to endeavor before commencing hostilities to try and settle matters by pacific measures the order was now given to move ahead faith it's easy enough to say that same exclaimed adair but it's much harder to do it however give way my lads we shall see the noses of the dons before long if they stop to show them and if not we shall chance to get sight of their coat-tails a hearty laugh from his boat's crew as they bent lustily to their oars followed this sally as the crews of the heavier boats laboured with all their strength they made good way and for some time kept the two light gigs in sight they now entered a reach of a mile and a half in length at the head of which according to the consul's description the fort would be found the captain and murray pulled on for some distance though the mist which still hung over the river hid them from sight of the fort not a breath of air stirred the leaves of the forest the monkeys as before chattered among the branches and bright-coloured macaws flew screaming overhead at length far in the distance on the summit of a bold point projecting into the river the stockade they might have to attack came into sight the rays of the rising sun shining on the fort brought it into bold relief against the dark woods and above the deep shadows cast across the stream no flag waved over it and no sign of life appeared not a canoe floated on the water no sound was heard captain hemming thought that had he not wished first to try pacific measures he might have managed to surprise its garrison without resistance but like many another gallant man he had no wish to fight if it could be avoided and he only hoped to induce the nicaraguans to yield without being compelled to resort to force the gigs proceeded but slowly as the current here ran even faster than in any part of the river still no notice was taken of the boats and murray who shared his captain's sentiments had begun really to think that the matter would be settled without bloodshed when two wreaths of smoke issued from the stockades and a couple of shots whistled near them at the same moment up went the flag of the nicaraguan republic and the next instant volleys of musketry came rattling by them from either side of the river colonel salas evidently does not intend to receive us as friends observed captain hemming order up the other boats murray the sooner we give him and his followers the lesson they require the better we will at once make a dash at the fort it will not do to stop here and be shot down like dogs as dick needham saw the flag run up he exclaimed we'll have that bit of bunting down before long lads and it won't be my fault if i don't get hold of the halyards the crews cheered and pulled on with renewed vigour their strength however was taxed to the utmost for the banks of the river closing in at this point the water rushed down like a mill-stream and at times the boats remained almost stationary it was no easy task to urge even the light boats ahead though showers of shot came rattling about them from numerous concealed foes on either side it would have been useless to return their fire for not an enemy showed himself the marines and soldiers however got their muskets ready to pick off any more adventurous foes who might for an instant appear among the trees but the enemy were too well accustomed to this sort of warfare to expose themselves and kept well under cover it was trying in the extreme but their gallant leader had resolved not to be defeated in his object and all hands willingly followed him he and murray took the lead in their respective gigs jack rogers with his brother tom in the pinnace which carried the lieutenant of the marines and a party of his men were close astern the frigates and corvettes barges with a detachment of the regiment and their captain were not far off the other boats were making the best of their way but found it impossible to keep up with the lighter built ones considering the showers of bullets which kept whizzing by them it seemed wonderful that as yet no one had been wounded they were not allowed however to proceed much farther with impunity the boats had been repeatedly hit and some of the oars had almost been cut in two 
as the headmost boats neared the fort the fire became hotter the bowman of the pinnace was seen to relax his efforts but still he pulled on a red stream issuing from his breast showed that he had been hit presently the oar slipped from his hands and he sank down into the bottom of the boat a marine immediately took his place directly afterwards another man was hit not a groan escaped him grasping his oar he attempted to make another stroke but his eyes gazed wildly blood issued from his mouth the oar escaped from his hands and he fell back on the thwart a lifeless corpse another man sprang to his place and with little ceremony shoving the body aside pulled lustily away the crews of the other boats were treated in the same manner nothing daunted other men took the places of those who were wounded the gigs offering a smaller mark were less frequently hit but the white splinters which flew from their gunwales and oars showed that the bullets of the enemy had found them out one of the captain's crew was hit and directly afterwards murray had another man hurt it was a severe trial for the courage and patience of all for eager as they were to get at the foe they could do nothing but sit still and be fired at short as the distance was an hour passed by before they reached the fort at length the leading gigs got up to it as they did so the river appeared to decrease in width while the stream consequently ran still faster and the fire became even hotter than before the gigs and pinnace which kept well up with them had now got close to the fort the stockades rising on the projecting point high above their heads the marines in the last mentioned boat took aim at any of the enemy who were seen for a moment on the fortifications while the soldiers in the other boats did their best to clear the banks of their persevering foes still however they were exposed to a galling fire from all directions from foes on the starboard hand and others concealed enemies on the bows and quarter several more men were hit but as long as they could pull a stroke they refused to quit their oars the boats were almost riddled with shot the gigs were struck several times between wind and water the holes being filled up with handkerchiefs or whatever first came to hand archie gordon was employed in stopping one with his handkerchief when murray to his dismay saw him fall forward steering with one hand he lifted the lad up with the other don't mind me said archie in a faint voice looking very pale a sharp blow made me topple over but i don't think that i am much hurt i trust not my boy but we will get a doctor to look to you as soon as possible answered murray placing him into the stern sheets by his side so as to cover him as much as possible again and again the boats were hit and half the oars were cut through some breaking off others were immediately got out to supply their places the boats all this time were slowly working their way along against the stream this was the most trying part of the whole voyage upwards of an hour they had been under fire and for nearly forty minutes more they were passing the stockades exposed to it at length the extreme point was neared this they had to round and then to pull some distance up the river so as to be able to descend rapidly to the landing-place which was on the other side of the point the crews renewed their efforts and the remainder of the flotilla now appeared coming slowly up as the leading gig at length rounded the point her crew uttered a cheer and as the river became wider and the current ran with less force they were able to make better way and soon getting beyond the fire of the fort they were exposed only occasionally to a shot from some of the more persevering of the enemy who had made their way along the banks murray was thankful when he could at length examine poor archie's wound the lad had fainted from loss of blood the bullet it appeared had lodged in his side mctavish the assistant surgeon was fortunately in the pinnace and when she came up he took the midshipman under his charge as well as several other poor fellows severely wounded tom held him in his arms while the doctor probed his wound and at length succeeded in extracting the bullet he'll not die i hope said tom feeling very sick and sad not this time i trust he has a good constitution and that's everything in his favour answered mctavish there was no time however for sorrow or sentiment most of the boats had now got up and captain hemming not waiting for the rearmost ones which he calculated would arrive in time to land the men after the first part had gained a footing on the banks gave the order to attack with true british cheers the crews gave way 
and the stream now being in their favour the boat still exposed to a warm fire rapidly approached the landing-place in front of them was the principal stockade guarding the landing-place a gun on which opened fire as the boats kept in line it did no damage for missing one it missed all pulling quickly on the leading boats of the flotilla soon reached the landing-place when the captain with jack and terence were the first to leap on shore tom and gerald with needham came close behind them the marines led by their tall commander followed and formed quickly up the blue jackets and soldiers immediately afterwards landed and the captain with his companions again giving forth hearty cheers rushed towards the stockade in which the gun was posted the nicaraguans dark stalwart fellows stood their ground bravely till they saw the cutlasses of the seamen waving about their heads and the bayonets of the soldiers pointed at their breasts when a well-directed volley of musketry laid many low and as the seamen climbed over the stockade the survivors abandoning their gun fled for shelter within the fort here rallied by their officers they made another stand but the english sailors rushing forward were soon climbing over the defences in spite of the showers of bullets which were flying past them the blue jackets and redcoats vied with each other as to who should be first over and as they sprang down into the fort the former began slashing and hewing away with their cutlasses while the latter forming as they got over brought their weapons to the charge and dashed forward against the main body of the enemy who stood their ground needham had not forgotten his resolve to haul down the nicaraguan flag accompanied by the midshipmen and several men having seen that it was flying at the further angle of the fort he made a dash towards it a dozen or twenty of the enemy led by an officer seeing him coming and guessing his object threw themselves in his way to cut him off with a cheer he and his companions dashed forward to the attack the enemy withstood them for a few seconds but a small party of marines made so vigorous a charge that they took to flight others of the garrison had however rallied in the neighbourhood of the flagstaff still the dauntless seamen dashed on and so well used their cutlasses that they forced their way through them and dick with a loud shout sprang up to the flagstaff in another moment he had the halyards in his hand and down came the nicaraguan colours having tucked them under his arm he again with cutlass in hand made a rush at the enemy the fight in the meantime had been raging in all parts of the fort its issue was never for a moment doubtful though the enemy mustering nearly two hundred strong showed a bold front but they could not withstand the charge now made by the gallant soldiers and blue jackets turning tail off they scampered as fast as their legs could carry them through the outlets in the rear of the fort on lads on was the cry and after them dashed the whole body of their assailants uttering a ringing cheer which tended to increase the rapidity of their flight jack and terence and the other officers led the sailors captain babbicome though undoubtedly not as active as the rest had managed to scramble into the fort and now puffing and blowing was well in advance as soon as they gained the shelter of the wood many of the fugitives turned and fired but again fled as their pursuers came up with them tom and gerald having assisted to capture the flag were somewhat behind the rest as they ran on they saw the obese though gallant commander just before them flourishing his sword and shouting on lads on tally ho tally ho we'll have their brushes before long make mincemeat of the rascals tally ho boys tally ho his voice grew hoarser and hoarser some of the fugitives stopped turned round and fired suddenly down he went on his face his sword flying out of his hand there's old babbicome knocked over cried tom and gerald in the same breath though they would have preferred seeing the end of the fun as they called it they felt that it was their duty to stop and assist him having summoned some of the men near them to their aid they lifted him up but no wound could they discover i'm done for he groaned out where are you hit sir asked tom nowhere that i know of but i'm shaken to death running doesn't suit my constitution carry me back to my boat his groans and sighs showed that he was much hurt his own men coming up obeyed his orders and tom and his companions continued the pursuit a nicaraguan 
officer and several men had already been taken prisoners and sent down to the landing-place every now and then the pursuers caught sight of the enemy among the trees who as soon as they saw them coming again darted off easily finding concealment in the dense forest i wish that archy was here cried gerald he would have enjoyed the fun needham with several other sailors were with the midshipmen just then they caught sight of a person trying to conceal himself behind a tree by his uniform they knew that he was an officer we must have that fellow cried tom dashing forward the officer who had a sword in his hand made a cut at tom which he parried with his cutlass the nicaraguan then seeing several of his enemies approaching cried out for quarter and presented the hilt of his sword come along cried tom highly delighted you're my prisoner no one shall hurt you now and he and gerald who was close at hand grasping him by the arm shouted to needham and the rest to come and take charge of him just at that moment the bugle echoing through the forest sounded the recall the summons was heard by the fugitives with more satisfaction probably than by the pursuers the latter obeyed it and blue jackets marines and soldiers began to assemble from all directions in which the flying enemy had led them few prisoners only besides the officers had been taken for the thickness of the forest favoured the flight of the nicaraguans here and there the dead body of one of them was seen shot in the pursuit or who had fallen down after being wounded in the fort the midshipmen were excessively proud of their capture and needham not the less so at having the nicaraguan flag to show as a trophy at length the greater number of the pursuers returned to the fort the remaining stragglers who had been led by their ardour farther than the rest came in soon afterwards and the whole being mustered it was found that not a man had been killed on shore and five only wounded tom and gerald now came up to the captain with their prisoner and received due commendation for their zeal needham followed with the flag which he had kept fast under his arm and which he now produced in due form the captain having heard the particulars did not fail to promise that he should receive a reward for his bravery he then addressed the men and expressed his satisfaction at the gallantry and good discipline they had displayed we have still some work to do my lads however and the more quickly we set about it the sooner we shall get out of this broiling spot and have our wounded men properly cared for on board ship he said we have to make the place untenable for some time to come by the rascals you have so soundly thrashed all hands then set to work to spike the guns to break the trunnions and to gather together all the muskets and ammunition which the fugitives had left behind them with many a cheer the sailors who enjoyed the fun then rolled the guns down the steep bank into the river while one party was thus engaged the other was employed in pulling up the posts of the stockades and piling them in great heaps with the muskets on the top the heaps were then set on fire and the place which a few hours before presented so formidable an appearance was utterly destroyed the order was now given to embark murray had been directed by the captain to go over the ground and ascertain the number of the killed twenty dead bodies were found several more having been seen in the forest it was computed that twice that number had been wounded the larger proportion of these had however been assisted off by their companions some of the prisoners proved to be boatmen pressed into the service twelve of these were taken to act as pilots a hint being given them that should they attempt to play tricks they would be forthwith shot the two officers looked very crestfallen jack had one of them in his boat and terence took charge of the other they were not very attractive gentlemen and did little else than bemoan their hard fate and smoke their cigarettes which they assiduously employed themselves in rolling up jack's prisoner for most of the time gave vent to his ill-humour by abusing the commandant who had been the cause of their misfortune jack knew but little of spanish but still he was able to make out what was said what regular daredevils you english are nothing can stop you cried the officer 
you are right my friend trifles don't hinder us when we have an object in view and as we were going up with purely pacific intentions merely to inquire why your colonel had carried off two of our countrymen it was not pleasant to find ourselves fired at by you and your people though you might have thought it good fun we have made you pay pretty dearly however old fellow for your amusement yes you have indeed replied the don but you have not recovered the men you came to search for no but still you are not likely to regain your liberty till you find them for us then we shall be prisoners for ever sighed the don why what have become of the men asked jack they are gastados expended answered the don what would you say if we were to expend you and your brother officer by running you up to the yardarm of one of our ships asked jack the remark made the don shake in his shoes the expedition remained for the night at the spot from which they had started in the morning the wounded were as well cared for as circumstances would allow great anxiety was felt by all hands for archie gordon the surgeon being unable to give a satisfactory report of his state his two friends begged leave to assist in attending on him he was frequently insensible and when he returned to consciousness the groans which he uttered showed how severely he was suffering the next morning the expedition got under way and piloted by the boatmen rapidly proceeded down the stream performing the distance in a few hours which had taken them so many days of hard toil to accomplish in their ascent several men were also on the sick list from fatigue and exposure to the hot sun by day and the damps of night none of the officers had suffered much except commander babacum who had remained unconscious from the time he had been carried on board his gig the surgeon announced his case to be one of sunstroke captain hemming therefore sent him down in his gig ahead that he might sooner obtain the assistance of his own doctor archie gordon was at once taken on board the frigate that he might be under the care of the surgeon who expressed great anxiety about him tom and needham were his constant attendants tom indeed watched over him when off duty with the affection of a brother never fear rogers said the surgeon observing how unhappy tom looked gordon will pull through if he keeps quiet and is watched over with the care which you show him tom was somewhat consoled on hearing this he sent off a dispatch to gerald by the first opportunity with a bulletin of their friend's state the report from the corvette was not so favourable the surgeon expressed his fears that the commander would not reach jamaica alive for the sake of his wounded men captain hemming was anxious to return as soon as possible to jamaica murray was walking the deck of the supplejack when a boat from the frigate came alongside and lieutenant rogers stepped on board good news alick he exclaimed we are to get under way immediately the wind will allow us and proceed at once to jamaica where the captain is anxious to land the sick and wounded i knew you would be glad to hear this you will receive i hope on arrival a due reward for your gallant deeds for every one says that you are sure to be promoted i shall certainly prize that for many reasons answered murray and thanks to you for cheering me up our energies have been taxed pretty severely for the last few days and i feel more out of spirits than usual what account do you bring me of poor archie the doctor is more hopeful about him than at first young highlander as he is he thinks that there is every prospect of his getting round again in time by careful nursing and i dare say your friends at st david's will be happy to take charge of him when we get to jamaica he will afford an object of interest to miss o'regan and draw her off from the thoughts of her own loss i trust that such may be the case said murray but my dear jack i have been oppressed with all sorts of evil forebodings about her i cannot help dreading that she has been attacked by fever or that she has met with some accident or that nonsense alick that's not like you interrupted jack you say that your energies have been severely taxed that alone is the cause of your forebodings of evil after we have been at sea a day or two you will laugh at them good-bye i must be off jack pulled on for the corvette and delivered the welcome order to prepare for sea the surgeon gave him a bad account of the commander his mind was wandering and he was every day becoming weaker 
he was continually talking of his beloved beeves and his pigs his orchard and his cabbage garden and sometimes he fancied that he was bestriding his trusty cob setting off to market and he would shout out to his old housekeeper martha to have his dinner ready at his return poor fellow he would have been wiser had he continued cultivating his little farm in bedfordshire instead of tempting again the treacherous deep thought jack however probably alick will get the vacancy so it's all right a short time afterwards a light breeze came off the land the sails were let fall and the frigate leading the way the small squadron shaped a course for jamaica the supple jack proved herself to be a fast craft being well able to keep up with the frigate and corvette so murray considered that he could report favourably of her to the admiral when within about a day's sail of jamaica the corvette which had separated during the night from her consort was again seen approaching with her flag half-mast high the flags of the other two ships were lowered in compliment and inquiries by signal were made as to when the melancholy event had occurred the reply was on the previous evening and that the commander's last request had been that he might be buried on shore the next day the squadron came to an anchor in port royal harbour eager as captain hemming knew that murray would be to proceed to kingston his first duty was to attend to the funeral of the late commander of the corvette which could not be delayed the boats of the squadron being manned followed the tudor's barge which contained the coffin on landing it was borne by a party of seamen to the burying ground of port royal where the garrison chaplain performed the service and the marines having fired a volley over the grave the party returned on board the ceremony being over the flags were hoisted up and it must be confessed that very little more was thought of or said about poor commander babacombe and his eccentricities captain hemming and murray then proceeded up to kingston where they were received with warm congratulations and highly complimented by the admiral i have already sent your dispatch home he said turning to alick and i have secured your promotion i hope in the meantime i intend to give you an acting order to take command of the corvette and i shall be glad captain hemming to appoint any officer you can recommend to the supplejack the captain at once named lieutenant rogers i should have been glad to have suggested my first lieutenant mr cherry but i am unwilling to spare him and i believe that he would rather continue as at present on board the frigate on hearing that his young cousin was wounded the admiral at once desired murray to have him brought up to the pen if the doctor thought he could be moved and you i suspect will not object to a day or two's leave to enjoy a trip into the country he added i shall be happy to see you on your return alick thanked the admiral who advised him to set out forthwith while he invited captain hemming to dinner the boats were sent back with directions that the wounded midshipman should be brought to the pen the next day and murray taking the admiral's advice set off for st david's hoping to arrive there before nightfall End of chapter sixteen section twenty of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter seventeen jack rogers in command of the supple jack alick's letter to jack the caymans shoal of turtle dolphins chases a slaver havana scenes on shore slavers in harbour polite invitation from a slave dealer jack accepts it the venus slips out of harbour some time after the events related in the last chapter jack rogers walked the deck of the supple jack as her commander he having superseded murray who had been promoted as every one acknowledged a just reward for his gallantry at cartagena higson had been made a lieutenant and appointed to the tutor while terence adair had rejoined the plantagenet the commander who had been appointed to the corvette in the place of poor captain babacombe had fallen sick and as there was every probability of his having to return to england 
jack had hopes that the admiral would appoint murray to the command if i hadn't the supple jack i should have been delighted to serve under him said jack to adair who had come on board to see him i have no idea of a fellow being jealous of another's good fortune for no one deserved his more than alec murray i only wish that i may get the chance of doing something in the supple jack i won't throw it away if i can help it you will have more opportunity than i shall have aboard the frigate answered terence and i only wish that i could be with you or murray if he gets the command of the tutor i am sure at all events to fall in with a slaver or two or perhaps have some such work as that of st juan cut out for me said jack i am now i believe to be ordered to havana so johnny farong assured me yesterday and as he is certain to be well informed i expect every hour to receive my dispatches from the admiral while jack was speaking a boat was seen coming down the harbour and in a short time he received from the officer who came in her an order to proceed at once to havana and on his way to keep a sharp lookout for slavers of which it was known there were a good many on the coast he at the same time got a letter from murray who had been residing with his friends at st david since he gave up the command of the supplejack we may take a glance at its contents which thus ran dear jack since i cannot tear myself away from this eden though had i a pair of wings i would do so for a brief space to see how you are getting on on board the little brig i must beg you to be content with the few lines i have the time to write before our sable mercury starts for kingston i am as you may suspect supremely happy stella has recovered her spirits and every day becomes more attractive it is beautiful to see her watch over my young kinsman archie who is slowly recovering from his dangerous wound the doctor says that had it not been for her watchful care he would have succumbed to the fever which attacked him after his arrival here you ask me when our marriage is to take place stella will not hear of it her father's death is too recent and she will not tempt me away from my duty for she thinks that if i became a married man i shall wish to remain on shore and i cannot help acknowledging that in that respect she is right she wants me at all events to serve as a commander till i obtain a post rank and her kind friends here offer her a home till she has one of her own i long for the time however when i may take her to scotland as my bride and present her to my family in truth though i have often fancied that nothing would make me wish to leave the navy i have begun to meditate doing so rather than be separated from her perhaps however i may be able to persuade her to yield to my wishes and as the tutor will probably remain on the station i shall constantly be returning to port and be able to enjoy her society i am sure you say to get command of the corvette provided grafton goes home and the doctors say that there is no chance of his recovering out here stella desires to be kindly remembered to you as do all your friends at st david's you have won their hearts i assure you and they will be happy to see you whenever you return to jamaica they press me to remain here till i am ordered to join the ship and as you may suppose i am perfectly happy to accept their hospitality my cousin archie desires to be remembered to those young reefers your brother tom and desmond i hope some day to be among them and assist in keeping them out of mischief give my kind regards to terence and believe me your very affectionate friend alexander murray jack had no time to answer this letter as the breeze proving favourable he was obliged to put to sea according to his instructions during his run westward he kept a bright lookout for slavers in all directions it was just daylight a mist lay on the surface of the ocean which completely shut out any object at a distance while a light breeze from the southeast filled the brig's sails and impelled her at the rate of two or three knots an hour through the water harry bevan who had joined from the frigate was officer of the watch the men with trousers tucked up and buckets in hand were about to commence the operation of washing decks 
i say exclaimed tom who had been sent forward on some duty i never believed in the great sea serpent but as sure as i'm alive that must be the fellow right ahead wriggling along at a tremendous rate if you listen you'll hear the noise he's making broken water ahead shouted the lookout forward that i'm sure it cannot be said bevan he however as a precaution brought the brig to the wind and directed tom to call the commander jack was quickly on deck keep her away again he exclaimed after he had examined the object which had so astonished tom that is neither the head nor tail of the big sea serpent but a shoal of turtles which having come from the bay of honduras are bound to the cayman islands where they are going to lay their eggs he said laughing heartily at tom's notion the brig was soon in the midst of them their columns dividing to get out of her way it was wonderful the noise they made as their fins rapidly struck the water in their onward course soon afterwards the mist lifted and the lofty trees which grew on the great cayman could be seen rising out of the water some fifteen miles off appearing like a grove of masts emerging from the ocean directly afterwards the mist which still hung in the west was swept away exposing to view the sails of a square topsail schooner shining in the rays of the sun with snowy whiteness jack immediately ordered the brig to be kept away and made all sail in chase the schooner held her course for some time but at length discovering that the brig had kept away set also every stitch of canvas she could carry this at once betrayed her character for had she been an honest trader she would have had no reason to run from an english brig the crew felt as eager to overtake her as did the commander it was the first of this sort of work they had had and they indulged with immense satisfaction in the idea of carrying back a prize full of slaves to port royal long tom was got ready for action as it was not likely that the slaver if such she was would yield without making every effort to escape the chase showed that she had a remarkably nimble pair of heels for fast as the supple jack was after a couple of hours had passed by she appeared to have gained little or nothing on her do you think we shall take her asked tom of needham who had been appointed as gunner of the supple jack if the wind freshens and we have the first of it before it reaches her we may get her within range of long tom and if then won't be my fault if we don't bring down some of her spars but if night comes on before our shot can reach her she may manage to slip out of our hands in the dark but we have most of the day before us and we surely shall get up with her before then observed tom you see we have run on already two hours and are no nearer than at first said needham if we were to chase her round the world and she was to sail twelve knots to our ten she would soon be out of sight so i don't feel very certain that we shall have her ladyship but if we miss her this time we may fall in with her another at the time the men were piped to dinner the supple jack had not gained more than at first on the chase still jack persevered trusting that something might happen to favour him the men in their eagerness to watch the chase hurried up on deck and the officers remained below as short a time as possible every expedient that could be thought of was adopted to increase the speed of the brig every variation of the breeze was carefully watched by jack's vigilant eyes now he ordered a pull at the starboard now at the larboard braces while every inch of canvas that could be set was kept thoroughly wetted so that not a thimble full of the precious wind could escape till it had done its duty the day wore on it was tantalizing in the extreme to see the stranger still keeping so far ahead the breeze however at length freshened and the stronger it blew the faster the brig sailed she was evidently nearing the chase but the sun casting a ruddy glow over the western sky and across the laughing sea was sinking rapidly towards the horizon turning the sails of the schooner which had hitherto appeared of snowy whiteness into deep shadow long tom will reach her now i've a hope sir said needham and if we can knock away some of her flying kites she may be ours before the day is over 
try at all events answered jack and needham giving a friendly slap on the breech of the gun while he cast his eye along the sight brought it to a proper elevation and the brig yawing slightly he pulled the trigger the shot flew straight for the chase but as jack watched its course he saw that it fell into the water short of the mark it was not far off though sir said needham and if we hold on at the rate we are going we shall soon have her within range the gun was again loaded and after another few minutes jack ordered it once more to be fired but with no better success than at first and as he saw it would be useless to fire till he had gained still more on the chase the lower limb of the sun had now however reached the horizon below which the glowing orb rapidly sank and the shades of night came creeping over the ocean still the shadowy outline of the schooner like a dark phantom stalking over the deep could be discerned ahead a vigilant lookout was kept but hour after hour went by and the brig appeared to have got no nearer to her than at first jack and most of his officers remained on deck towards morning the distance seemed somewhat lessened he had his eyes on the chase and could not help hoping that by daylight they might be near enough to try what long tom could do when the sails of the schooner began to grow less and less distinct he had a moment before seen her he rubbed his eyes she had disappeared it was very provoking still he couldn't but hope that in the morning they would again get sight of her ordering the same course to be kept he at length turned in desiring to be immediately called should she be again seen when morning broke a mist similar to that which had risen the previous day obscured all distant objects a lookout was sent aloft but he could see nothing and when the sun rose in the sky and the mist dispersed the chase was nowhere visible better luck next time observed jack when he came on deck and he ordered the brig to be kept on her proper course for st antonio the westernmost point of cuba several vessels were sighted during the day but they were too far off to make it worth while jack considered to go out of his course to speak to them the midshipmen employed themselves in a variety of ways tom had of course brought spider who assisted them to idle away many a spare hour tom and desmond one day amused themselves by making a target of a piece of canvas it was painted in circles of different colours with a yellow bull's-eye in the usual fashion this was suspended by a line at the end of a spar rigged from the fore yard-arm on about a level with the bulwarks and well answered the purpose intended with half a dozen ship's pistols they began blazing away sometimes hitting the mark though as often it must be confessed missing it tom proved himself decidedly the best shot desmond declared that his pistol somehow or other shot crooked whenever he failed to hit the target they thus passed away many an hour in calm weather and jack considered that the powder was well expended as it taught them how to handle their weapons mctavish and the purser in the meantime got out lines and hooks baited simply with pieces of canvas the former wishing to obtain some dolphins for examination which had been seen darting through the water on either side of the brig hurrah exclaimed mctavish i've got hold of a big fellow at last lend a hand to haul him in norris in another minute a good-sized fish was hauled on deck do you call that a dolphin said tom i thought a dolphin was a fellow with a big head and large fins of all the colours of the rainbow it is undoubtedly a dolphin answered mctavish if you haul it out of the shade of the bulwarks you will see that it is of cerulean hue there it won't retain that colour long it's changing already now it is purple and before long as its life ebbs it will become black but hurrah i have another bite three other dolphins were hauled up in quick succession and taken forward to be anatomized by the surgeon several spectators watched the operation hallo cried mctavish as he cut open one of the fish this fellow has swallowed something very hard and to the astonishment of all he pulled out two bullets in another were found three and inside a third a similar number there could be no doubt that they had swallowed the bullets which fell into the water from the midshipmen's pistols the fact proved the rapidity with which dolphins are capable of swimming as it could not be supposed that they had all been close to the spot where the bullets fell nor could they have seen them till they reached the surface 
as however many of the bullets had ricocheted for a considerable distance the fish had probably caught sight of them as they first struck the water and darting after them caught them as they began to sink the brig continued her course and having rounded cape sant antonio sailed eastward for havana keeping however at a respectful distance from the numerous low sandy islands or keys as they are called which lie off the northern shore of the island and had brought many a tall ship to destruction at length the irregular outline of the hills above the magnificent harbour of havana appeared in sight a fair and fresh breeze filled the sails of the brig and carried her rapidly towards the mouth of the harbour presently a lateen rigged craft a pilot vessel came sweeping out from behind the high threatening rocks on the summit of which the massive fortifications guarding the entrance of the port were now discernible the pilot vessel was soon close on board but jack waved her off being very well able he considered to take in his small brig without assistance the brig was now running through a channel between three or four hundred yards broad and half a mile in length which leads into the magnificent land-locked harbour high on the starboard side rose the massive fortress of el moro and on the port that of la ponta extending from either side of which could be seen the encircling line of fortifications which protect the city and harbour the brig passing through the narrow entrance the whole panorama of the magnificent landlocked bay with its fleet of vessels some at anchor others moored with their heads to the quay its numberless boats with lateen sails and hulls painted some of a bright blue others of a scarlet hue and others again striped with green and white darting about in all directions its great square stone warehouses fronting the water its many mansions the residences of nobles and merchants its beautiful-looking villas and groves of palm-trees the high-peaked roofs of its convents and tall grey towers of its churches rising above the whole now appeared in full view the brig appeared in a complete lake the fort of lapanta high above near which she had passed completely shutting out the entrance of the harbour on the shores around were seen numberless hamlets of every hue the rich foliage of the tropical trees and shrubs giving a cheerful aspect to the surrounding barren slopes as did the bright green jalousies of most of the residences and the flowering trees which rose among them to the city in every open space visible were seen slaves hurrying here and there with heavy loads seamen of all nations strolling along intermixed with the far-famed volantes brilliant with burnished metal rolling in and out of gateways the steed which drew it bestrode by a postillion six or eight feet from the body of the vehicle the brig was quickly surrounded by boats bringing off vegetables fruit and fish some of them containing those persevering personages ever present in foreign ports washerwomen and washermen their laudable object being to solicit the honour of cleansing the dirty linen of the officers and crew jack hoped to find some amusement on shore before however ordering his gig to be got ready he was engaged for some time not in examining the beauties of the harbour but in casting searching glances around to discover such rakish wicked-looking craft as were likely to be engaged in the slave trade he marked several of suspicious appearance we must have some of these fellows bevan he observed keep a bright lookout on their movements if we are off watch they will take the opportunity depend on it to slip out of the harbour i have no doubt that the fellows cursed us in their hearts when they saw the little brig enter the harbour among the commercial cities of the western hemisphere havana ranks next to new york the harbour is the best in the west indies and is unequalled in beauty by any in the world it is nearly three miles long and a mile and a half in width while completely sheltered from every wind by the surrounding heights so great is the depth of water that the largest ships can come close up to the quays the city stands on the western shore of the bay the streets of the old part within the walls are narrow and far from clean but those of the suburbs which cover a much larger space than the city itself are broad and well laid out many of them being handsome and tolerably free from dirt 
besides the two strong fortresses at the entrance batteries run along both shores while fortifications frown from all the surrounding heights the houses which are in the moorish style have excessively thick walls and are mostly of one story the windows however are unglazed and on account of the heat of the climate always kept open the object of most interest in the city is the cathedral not on account of its beauty but because it contains the bones of columbus which were removed here from the church of santo domingo in hispaniola at the end of the last century the chief attractions of the place are its pasios or public drives of which it possesses three two inside and one outside the walls some of them are ornamented with statues of royal personages more or less ugly with rows of poplars on either side and with fountains and gardens here in the afternoon the world of fashion resort and they are thronged with young creoles in evening dress and round hats employed in casting admiring glances at the fair dames who drive slowly up and down the carriage road in their wide and open volantes their heads adorned as if for a ballroom with natural flowers and generally arrayed in costumes of all the colours of the rainbow jack felt at first somewhat indignant as he observed the impudent glances so he considered them cast by the youths at the young ladies but soon came to the conclusion that they had no objection to be so looked at and would indeed have felt injured had they not received this style of homage from the opposite sex as he passed through the streets he could look with ease through the large open windows into the drawing-rooms of the houses where in the evening when not abroad the ladies of the family are wont to assemble the older dames seated in rocking-chairs the younger in front of the iron bars by which alone ingress from without is prevented here they can see every one passing and be seen in return the volante is as worthy of a description as the gondola of venice the dames of cuba delight in it for it is not only picturesque but luxurious in the extreme it is made to contain two sitters with comfort but when a duenna is in attendance she is seated on a middle seat between her charges it has two enormous wheels strong and thick the body is supported on the axle tree and swings forward from it on springs it is somewhat low down and affords abundance of room for the feet which are supported by a brightly polished metal bar which runs across the footboard it is most remarkable for the shafts which are fourteen feet in length the extreme ends resting on the saddle of the horse who has thus entirely to support the whole weight of the vehicle there is thus between the horse's tail and the carriage a space of nearly seven feet the postilion is generally a very heavy negro who rides the unfortunate horse those used by people of fashion are drawn by two horses one outside the shafts on which the postilion sits he is as remarkable an object as the vehicle itself he wears a huge pair of footless boots the top rising ten inches or so above his knees so that they nearly touch his elbows while to the bottom are secured huge iron spurs his breeches are white and his jacket red ornamented with gilt lace while a broad-brimmed hat covering his woolly pate completes his costume still barbarous and awkward as the affair appears it looks perfectly suitable to surrounding objects the fair occupants seem also in their proper places with their gaily coloured costumes and their dark hair fastened by a high comb and ornamented generally with natural flowers jack did not consider their beauty so surpassing as he had been led to expect while he thought the older dames perfectly hideous but then the recollection of the lily and rose in the cheeks of his fair countrywomen was too recent to allow him to admire them as he might otherwise have done he was highly amused at seeing in some of the dining halls one of those silver ornamented vehicles placed at the farther end its usual position when not in use as far as he could judge the male portion of the population passed their evenings in smoking cigars and playing billiards when not engaged in dancing or listening to music every evening before the captain-general's house in the plaza a military band played for an hour when the men collected by hundreds but a few ladies however appearing among them 
gambling in one form or another appeared to be the occupation of all orders encouraged considerably by the government who had public lotteries tickets and minute portions of tickets being daily vended in the streets jack and his officers were overwhelmed with invitations not only from english and americans but from spaniards some of whom he was warned might possibly have a motive in wishing to make their stay on shore agreeable they being owners or in some way interested in the rakish-looking craft in the harbour and on which it was his special duty to keep an eye picturesque and attractive as havana is in many respects jack came to the opinion that it would undoubtedly become a much finer place were it in the hands of the english or americans once upon a time it did become a british possession when in the year seventeen sixty two the spaniards and english went to war as soon as hostilities had broken out the british government dispatched a fleet under sir george pocock with an army of one thousand six hundred men commanded by the earl of albemarle the fleet consisted of twenty-two sail of the line four ships of fifty guns ten frigates and seventeen small vessels that so powerful a force was sent out showed the belief of the english in the strength of the fortifications the spaniards however had but little stomach for the fight while the fleet threatened them on the seaside the troops landed to the east and west of the city and attacking it in the rear quickly made themselves masters of the renowned fortifications on the return of peace a few months afterwards it was once more placed under the fearful mismanagement of the spaniards and now only awaits a favourable opportunity to be taken possession of by the yankees whatever may be said of havana jack found it a very pleasant place but he took good care never to sleep on shore or indeed at any time to remain longer away from his ship than possible he made several excursions round the harbour not so much to enjoy its beauties as to examine the before-mentioned rakish-looking craft which lay moored to the quays apparently for the purpose of taking in cargo he could never however observe anything going forward on board them during the daytime needham had however several times in the evening taken a pull in the dinghy among the vessels he reported that there was some bustle on board one of them in particular and that he could hear the sound of hammering going on within her it is my idea sir that they are fitting up slave decks depend on it before long some of them will be trying to get out if they have the chance without our seeing them i marked a craft called the venus which came in at sunset when you were on shore and if she is not the very schooner we chase she is wonderfully like her she is large and to my mind faster than any of them but if she can get whatever she wants and her cargo shipped we may be sure it won't be long before she tries to slip out unknown to us jack thought that needham was probably right in his conjectures for one thing was certain that while the commander of the venus knew that he was watched and likely to be followed he would not attempt to put to sea jack waited patiently he knew that at all events he was of some service in thus locking up these traitors in human flesh if he could not catch them he could at all events prevent them from doing harm he had accepted several invitations and had been seen at both english and spaniards houses at one of the latter he had met a spaniard don mateo who spoke english well and paid him great attention on inquiry he found that he was a slave merchant the owner of a number of vessels employed in making frequent trips to the coast of africa and back jack had hitherto refused his invitations though his parties were among the most brilliant and his daughters the most attractive of the black-eyed damsels of cuba jack however as every british officer engaged in the suppression of the slave trade ought to be was wide awake and when don mateo notwithstanding his former refusals again invited him and as many of his officers as he could bring to attend a dance to be given at his house the following evening he accepted the invitation and promised to bring all that could be spared from the ship on making inquiries he found as he suspected that the don was the owner of the venus he goes by the name of don mateo at present but he was long known on the coast of africa by that of pepe the pirate added his informant innumerable are the atrocities of which 
there is not the slightest doubt the fellow was guilty but he managed to escape hanging and having realized a large fortune got whitewashed by the authorities whom he still keeps in his pay changed his name and settled down in havana as a respectable merchant and shipowner though to avoid the risk of personal inconvenience he no more goes to sea as was his wont formerly he has a fleet of a dozen vessels or more employed in the middle passage as he bribes the government officials the captain of the port and others as well as the commanders of the spanish ships of war his vessels find no difficulty in getting in and out of harbour even though completely fitted for the slave trade and the latter frequently convoy them till they are free from the risk of capture by the english cruisers on this station on the other side of the atlantic they have to look after themselves but they get pretty correct information and three and four escape capture so that his adventures pay him handsomely having as i said grown honest he deals at present exclusively in blacks but he is known to have committed not a few acts of piracy in his younger days and the deaths of two or three british officers and the crews of several merchantmen are placed to his account the scoundrel exclaimed jack i do not fancy partaking of his hospitality as you please mr rogers but i would advise you to put your feelings in your pocket was the answer remember that you do not go to the fellow's house for your own amusement but for the good of the service in which you are engaged yes i see that you are right said jack i will do my best to catch one of his craft at all events accordingly on his arrival on board he sent needham in the dinghy as before to take a quiet pull among the ships the gunner came back about midnight and reported that the people were as busy as bees on board the schooner that the sails were being bent and according to his opinion she was getting ready for sea then she intends to sail to-morrow night while i am on shore observed jack i'll go however and try if we can play as good a game as she can that's it sir you will have plenty of time to get on board after she slips out and we can soon be after her jack accordingly ordered a boat to be in waiting for him and his officers at one of the less frequented landing-places a couple of hours after dark intending to remain at the party till that time and then to return on board he also gave directions to needham to have the cable hove short and everything to be ready for getting under way at a moment's notice he then told bevan and the other officers who were to accompany him that they were to leave don mateo's house if possible without being noticed and that he himself would follow at the time he had fixed on it was still daylight when he and his officers including three midshipmen in full rig pulled on shore to attend the ball the sun was just setting as they arrived at the wide entrance of don mateo's handsome mansion to which numerous volantes in rapid succession were bringing up the fair dancers while gentlemen were arriving either in various conveyances or on foot passing through a courtyard they were ushered upstairs into a spacious and well-lighted saloon with enormous windows looking on one side into a courtyard in the midst of which a fountain threw up jets of cooling water and on the other into a garden fragrant with sweet-scented flowers the dancing soon began no people could be more polite and attentive than their host and hostess to whose lovely daughters the english officers were immediately introduced at first jack found it somewhat difficult to get through the contradanza the dance for which havana is especially celebrated but his partner smiled graciously and assured him that he performed it to perfection when however he contrasted his own performance with that of the active toed spaniards he could not help feeling that he was receiving undue flattery as to his companions they soon had to give it up as a bad job though they did their best to make themselves agreeable by tucking their partners arms under theirs and chattering away in execrable spanish tom noticed that their host and his spouse kept a bright lookout on them and no sooner was a dance finished than they were taken up and introduced to other partners who were quite ready to forgive their mistakes the midshipmen at all events thought it very good fun and tom on looking at his watch felt very sorry that the hour was approaching at which jack had directed them to leave however his orders were not to be disobeyed so giving a hint to desmond and morris they made their way to the door when followed by bevan they slipped downstairs 
jack who watched them hoped that their departure had not been observed but don matteo begged to know why the midshipmen were gone jack replied that he considered early hours the best for such youngsters as they had their duty to attend to in the morning and that the elder one had gone to take care of them soon afterwards the surgeon and purser made their bow the former remarked that he must go on board and attend to his patients jack and jos green were the only officers remaining the latter had very little notion of dancing but that did not deter him from hauling his reluctant partner shrieking with laughter through the mazes of the dance at length losing his equilibrium as might have been expected down he came dragging the lady with him he managed however to save her from injury though he himself was somewhat severely hurt jack hastening up apologized explaining that the officer was but little accustomed to this sort of amusement and pretending to be very angry ordered him forthwith to return on board green who had received his instructions putting on a sulky look obeyed and joined the surgeon and purser who had been waiting for him outside jack who was in a hurry to be off walked up to his host and hostess and thanked them for their hospitality observing that he felt it his duty to go and look after his officers in vain don matteo pressed him to remain and offered to send an escort with him to the harbour it may be safer for you not to go alone my dear friend observed the don with a bland smile there are villains of all sorts about in the streets at night and you know that you english are not held in much love by those slaving gentry to whose business you are attempting to put a stop they would not scruple to stick a knife into your back if they found you walking alone i am much obliged to you for the warning and coming from you who must be well acquainted with the proceedings of the rascals it is of value but i am not afraid of them answered jack laughing we are prepared for all the tricks they may attempt to play us good-night don matteo dona isabella the don's buxom wife joined her solicitations to those of her husband and their fair daughters who gathered round jack resolved to prevent him from leaving but he was as determined as they were and making his best bow hurried out of the room he found his officers as had been agreed on a short distance from the house and keeping their swords ready for defence should they be attacked an event they were aware not at all unlikely to happen they made their way down to the landing-place as quickly as possible bevan and the midshipmen had already reached the boat and jumping in they pulled rapidly towards the supplejack as they did so they caught sight of a vessel gliding across the harbour which having passed the brig was soon lost to sight she has slipped by us sir and is standing out to sea exclaimed needham as soon as they stepped on board she is the venus sir i know for i was not far from her in the dinghy as she began to haul out from the quay i went away soon after dark to watch her as i felt sure we were right in thinking that she was about to put to sea the breeze was very light and the schooner could still be discerned from the deck of the supple jack jack waited till she had disappeared behind the rocks of the morrow the anchor was then hove up and sail being made on the brig she slowly glided out of the harbour the magnificent lighthouse on the west enabling her without difficulty to find her way through the narrow channel the schooner could be dimly seen ahead but it was doubtful whether she herself was aware that she was followed End of chapter seventeen section twenty one of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter eighteen part one chase of the venus a tornado jack again sights her captures her in two more sails for port royal a suspicious stranger a prize dispatch for assistance attacked hard pressed prisoners break loose the supple jack long after the chase had got out to sea remained concealed under the dark shadow cast by the castle across the entrance it then fell a dead calm and the schooner was completely lost to sight boats were now sent ahead to tow 
this was necessary indeed in order to keep the brig off the rocks it was slow work however and jack could only hope that with the rising sun the breeze would freshen so that he might make chase after the schooner the way in which she had crept out convinced him that she was a slaver had he before entertained any doubt as to don mateo's reasons for inviting him and his officers to the ball they now completely vanished it was evident that the old villain wanted to keep him and his officers on shore that the slaver might take the opportunity of putting to sea and getting a good start before it was discovered that she had gone she must have got away also jack very well knew with the connivance of the captain of the port who had of course been bribed by her owner as had likewise the officer in command at the moro who would not otherwise have allowed her to pass jack expected every instant to receive a shot from the castle but probably the last mentioned personage thought it prudent not to fire lest he might have been asked why he allowed the schooner to pass when daylight returned as jack and bevan swept their glasses round in every direction several sail were seen dotting the horizon jack handed his glass to needham which of them do you think is the venus he asked the centre one of those three vessels in the northeast sir answered needham promptly no doubt about that i know her by the whiteness of her canvas she must have had a pretty tidy breeze to get out so far while we lay becalmed you are right said jack that is the one i take to be the venus so do i observe bevan hurrah here comes a breeze we shall soon have the pleasure of making her better acquaintance i hope the boats were hoisted up and every stitch of sail the brig could carry was packed on her the breeze freshened and away she flew over the blue ocean leaving the white walls of the morrow far astern the question was whether the slaver would run for the gulf of florida or attempt to make her way through the bahama channel we must try at all events to get hold of her before nightfall observed jack or she will be playing us another trick and give us the go-by in the dark we'll try and do that same sir said needham if the wind holds with us as it does now it won't be a difficult job she doesn't seem to have much of it out there and we are getting up fast with her the supple jack indeed was gaining rapidly on the schooner but the treacherous wind soon gave indications of not being inclined to favour the british brig dark clouds gathering in the sky came sweeping rapidly over it all hands shorten sail shouted jack with startling energy be smart about it lads every one saw that not a moment was to be lost royals and topgallant sails were handed two reefs taken in the topsails the courses were clewed up not an instant too soon either for overheel the brig till the sills of her lee ports dipped into the water one of those tornadoes so frequent in the west indies had struck her though on coming up to the wind she faced it bravely down came the rain a real tropical torrent the drops as they fell being of the size of marbles leaping up again with a loud rattle like that of hail and literally deluging the deck in vain the sharpest eyes of those on the lookout endeavoured to pierce the watery veil the rain completely hid the slaver and all the surrounding vessels it was feared that she taking advantage of the chance offered her would do her best to escape the question was in what direction would she fly she would have a clear passage through the gulf of florida but then she well knew that she would be followed by the nimble supplejack rogers therefore came to the conclusion that she would steer for the bahama channel where if she could not escape herself she might hope to lead her pursuer to destruction needham was firmly of opinion that she would take that direction night was coming on and she would have a long start but jack determined to chance it and persevere with the chart to help us a bright lookout and the lee going we may disappoint her ladyship he observed laughing it's an ugly place i'll allow sir said needham but we must not be afraid of ugly places or we shall not do much in catching these slaving gentry it can't be much worse than we have seen in the china seas and off the coast of africa 
the tornado having passed over the brig's head was again put to the southwest and a bright lookout being of course kept all hoped to fall in once more with the venus the night was an anxious one the watch below turned in ready to spring on deck at a moment's notice neither jack bevan nor needham lay down the former constantly sweeping the horizon with their night-glasses in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the schooner as the first streaks of dawn tinged the eastern sky all hands were roused up to make sail and just as the orb of day like a mountain of fire appeared above the horizon the sails of the schooner were discerned on the port bow standing as was conjectured for one of the numerous intricate passages among the dangerous bahama shoals every stitch of canvas the brig could carry was immediately packed on her keep her away a couple of points cried rogers that will do we must get hold of madam venus before the day is many hours older fortunately there is still a good space of clear water before she can get in among the shoals and once up with the lady it won't be long before she is ours the wind held steady and the supple jack as tom declared skipped along more nimbly than she had ever yet moved long tom was got ready for action although the schooner was not likely to show much fight still he might be useful in bringing down her spars and so prevent her from getting in among the shoals before she could be captured though a fresh breeze was blowing the sea was tolerably smooth but on the north and eastward a line of white breakers and here and there an interval of blue water which marked the channels between them could be seen farther to the eastward were two suspicious-looking schooners evidently bent on making their way through one or other of the before-named channels we must have the big one first and then get hold of the other two said jack to bevan who stood by his side the lead was kept going and showed that the water was rapidly shoaling try her with long tom needham cried out jack he may chance to reach her it's as much as long tom will do sir but we'll see answered needham bringing the gun to bear on the chase away sped the shot but though well aimed it fell short of its mark we must have her at all costs cried jack eagerly or in less than five minutes she will be among the breakers and we shall be on shore give long tom a larger charge of powder and see what that will do needham did as he was ordered though it occurred to him that the dose he rammed down might chance to be too much for long tom's strength if so it would have the effect of blowing him and not a few of his shipmates out of the world still as he had faith in the gun's power of endurance he risked it without remark and taking good aim once more fired never had he made a better shot the missile swept the deck of the schooner carrying off the heads of three of her crew and killing and wounding others though this was unknown at the time the instant effect was to make her skipper haul down his colours and put the schooner about with her head off the bank and in a short time she was hove to near the brig of war which had also gone about jack jumping into a boat which was instantly lowered with a well-armed crew pulled on board the spanish captain whom he recognized as don lopez a polished-looking gentleman he had met soon after his arrival at havana at the house of don mateo made a polite bow and asked with an injured air why the english man-of-war had chased and fired at him i shall be able to give you an answer by and by my friend answered jack in the meantime don lopez i am anxious to get hold of those two schooners before they make their way through the channels to the northeast and as i do not wish to run the risk of casting away my brig i must trouble you to stand where you are and take me up alongside them as jack spoke he presented a double-barrelled pistol at the don's head as a sign that he was not to be trifled with you will not shoot me surely exclaimed the don not if you obey me answered jack but you will understand that i am in earnest now order the helmsman to keep the vessel away your men will do what you tell them i am very certain the don saw that there was no help for it and directed his motley and somewhat ruffian-like crew to do as jack told them we will have the nearest first and understand if she escapes us i intend to blow out your brains i shall regret it but necessity has no law the breeze was refreshing away dashed the venus sending the water bubbling up around her bows while the brig stood rather more to the southward keeping in deeper water to be ready to cut off either of the schooners which might attempt to escape in that direction at first they probably fancied that the venus had by some lucky chance got away from the brig of war but they were very soon mistaken when the british ensign which tom who had accompanied jack found on board flew out at her peak 
jack ordered a gun to be run through the bow port and one well-directed shot from it made the first schooner haul down her colours the second on seeing what had happened having no stomach for a fight followed her example and in half an hour jack had his three prizes standing out from the dangerous vicinity of the shoals he then ordered them all to heave to that he might examine them at leisure don lopez showed some anxiety to go into his cabin no no my friend said jack quietly you will allow me to accompany you i am sorry to be so uncourteous but i must have an examination of your papers he had ordered bevan and norris who had gone on board the other vessels not to allow anything to be thrown overboard or destroyed don lopez pulled his moustaches and accompanied his captor into the cabin where he most unwillingly produced his writing-case in it were found several documents one of them from no less a person than don mateo laguna directing him how to proceed on his arrival on the coast of africa there were several other papers very clearly implicating two or three persons of wealth in havana it was pretty clearly shown how these gentlemen obtained the fortunes which enabled them to hold so distinguished a place among the rank and fashion of that far-famed city on board also was found a large assortment of swords muskets and slave irons while a slave deck had been fitted up ready to receive the expected cargo of human beings jack took possession of the papers ah my friend here is another he observed as don lopez was endeavouring to shuffle back a document which had at first been overlooked jack examined it ah i see that fine large black brig which lay in shore near us was to join you shortly with the dollars and provisions you would require what is her name i should like to know all about her the caterina answered don lopez she is to sail under american colours and will have american papers a regular charter party the ship's roll and instructions from her reputed owners ten of her crew are american seamen the other twenty-five who are spaniards will be called passengers she has obtained all her papers from the american vice-consul and i very much doubt that any of you men of war would have ventured to interfere with her unless and don lopez smiled it had been for the information i so freely give you i hope you will take this into consideration in your further dealings with me i shall see about that answered jack despising the don who had been so ready to betray his associates in the nefarious traffic at present you will please to accompany me on board my brig as we are bound for jamaica the don with a grimace stepped into the brig of war's boat followed by his officers jack afterwards conveyed also the greater part of the crew to the brig where they were less likely to play tricks than if left on board their own vessel he sent also for the greater portion of the crews and all the officers of the other schooners the difficulty now however was how to man his prizes he gave the command of the venus to bevan with tom as his mate and six hands norris and another midshipman had charge of one of the other schooners with five hands and jos green with desmond to assist him had charge of the third with the same number of men he could ill spare so many hands but he hoped by vigilance to keep the spaniards in awe and to navigate the supplejack these arrangements being completed he made sail for port royal should the weather continue fine the task might be an easy one but should it come on to blow short-handed as he was he would have no little difficulty in working the brig and looking after his numerous prisoners many of whom were desperate ruffians and might possibly try to capture the brig and cut the throats of every one on board his only alternative therefore to avoid the risk of this would be to treat them as they intended to treat the slaves clap them in irons and shut them down under hatches or to place a sentry with orders to shoot the first who might attempt to regain his liberty needham highly approved of this plan it would serve them right sir if we were to do it at once it would save us a great deal of trouble in looking after the beggars he observed but don lopez considered himself a perfect gentleman and will complain that he was barbarously treated if we were to do so without sufficient cause remarked jack i let him complain then sir answered needham he may consider himself fortunate that we don't heave him and his villainous crew overboard jack only hoped that the necessity would not arise and as neither the officers nor men had arms of any sort for the knives even of the latter had been taken from them he had no fears about the matter he resolved to keep a bright lookout for the caterina which he thought would probably slip out of the harbour soon after him her captain not suspecting the fate of her consorts 
the wind was however light and contrary and he was much longer in making cape st antonio than he had hoped the necessity of treating the prisoners as needham had suggested came however sooner than jack expected he had allowed don lopez and his companions to enjoy as much fresh air and exercise as they wished for every day though he took the precaution to have a sentry on the quarter-deck who had received instructions to keep a watchful eye on the prisoners evening was coming on a fresh breeze was blowing and the little squadron under easy sail was standing to the westward just at that time a sail was sighted on the weather bow she was soon made out to be a large brig standing towards the little fleet jack observed that the prisoners were talking eagerly together and were evidently much interested in the appearance of the stranger on she came and though she was near enough for her colours to be seen she showed none what do you make her out to be asked jack of needham i should have taken her to be a spanish man-of-war but if she is she ought to have showed her bunting by this time he answered you'll pardon me sir he continued but i don't like the looks of the dons and i shouldn't be surprised if that craft is the caterina herself if so she will be trying to take some of our prizes and may be have a slap at us and i think it would be best to get these gentlemen out of the way as quickly as possible jack agreed with needham and going up to don lopez he observed i am sorry to inconvenience you but i have to request that you and your companions will go below and not return on deck till you receive my permission the don and his friends looked somewhat angry at hearing this and seemed inclined to disobey but a dozen stout seamen coming aft showed them that jack was in earnest and they uttering maledictions on his head were hurried below the sun had now reached the horizon when the stranger came within gunshot still without showing her colours jack had ordered the three schooners to keep close together under his stern he now fired a gun ahead of the stranger of which she took no notice but continued her course intending apparently to get to windward so as to be able to bear down at any time she might think fit on the captured slavers she has guessed what has happened sir observed needham and hopes during the night to have a chance of cutting off one of the prizes or all of them but she can't quite make up her mind to attempt it in daylight we must keep a bright look at and prevent her doing that same answered jack give her another shot from long tom and we will see if that has a better effect than the first the stranger took no notice further than hauling her wind so as to increase her distance from the brig of war jack guessed that her intention was to draw him away if possible from his prizes so that she might have a better chance of taking off one of them during the night he had no fears of the result of a fight should she venture to attack him at the same time under the circumstances he doubted whether it would be wise for him to become the assailant as the sun went down the stranger was still seen holding her former position on the weather bow of the supplejack it was very provoking to be thus bearded and he earnestly wished for daylight that he might have a better chance of success in attacking the daring craft for he had at length made up his mind to bring her to action and of course to capture her his greatest difficulty however would be should he succeed in manning her as she would require as many hands as the supplejack and he could ill spare any of his own crew he thought the matter over and called needham aft to consult with him well sir i was thinking that it would be a good plan to send the venus on to jamaica to get the assistance of the corvette she wouldn't be long in joining us and we might keep the stranger in play till then or if any accident was to happen to us she might come up in time to take her not that i doubt for a moment that if we can get her within range of our guns we should soon make her our prize it's rather a tough job i'll allow as the chase has forty hands or more on board and six or eight guns though it's not likely they are very heavy metal i like your plan said jack i was considering that it might otherwise be necessary to sink one or two of our prizes rather than run the risk of losing the caterina for i make sure that that brig out there is her jack gave the matter a few more minutes consideration and signalling to the three schooners to heave to he sent the purser on board the venus with directions to bevan at once to clap on all sail for port royal and to beg on his arrival there that the corvette or some other man-of-war might be immediately dispatched to his assistance as the night was dark he hoped that the stranger would not discover that the venus had parted company till daylight when she would have very little chance of overtaking her to prevent the risk of her doing so he hauled up close to the wind believing that he should thus soon again get sight of the stranger 
he was not mistaken for in little more than half an hour he sighted her standing the same course as before but rather more abeam keeping away again he shortened sail but she held the same course as before thus the night passed the stranger could be seen to the southward while the coast of cuba lay broad on the lee beam though undistinguishable in the darkness of night at length however the stranger disappeared but jack felt satisfied that she had not gone in chase of the venus and he still hoped to see her again at daylight he and the two schooners kept on their course under easy sail the officers in command of the latter were as eager as jack to bring the strange brig to action hoping to take part in the light each vessel had a couple of six-pounders on board which though not very heavy guns might do good service could they get near enough to the enemy to use them thus the night passed slowly away dawn at length returned and as the first rays of the rising sun glanced across the ocean they fell on the sails of the stranger about three miles off broad on the beam of the supplejack whose commander at once resolved to bring her to action while she on her part showed no disinclination for the fight she must have plenty of hands on board and pretty heavy metal or she would long ago have been off observed needham however we will see what long tom can do we will give him every opportunity of showing his qualities said jack and not let the slaver get too near us till we have knocked away some of his spars the stranger now kept edging down towards the brig of war which stood on under her topsails mainsail and headsails jack calculated that he should have time to throw three or four shots into her from long tom and then by making more sail give her a raking fire from his carronades he hailed the schooners and ordered norris and the master not to expose themselves more than necessary and only to fire when they had a good opportunity while by all means they were to avoid allowing the slaver brig to run aboard them the stranger which had again hauled her wind was still far beyond the range of long tom i don't think sir that they have got much stomach for the fight after all observed needham perhaps not answered jack but i suspected from the fellow's manoeuvres that he still hopes to cut off our prizes and is only waiting the opportunity for doing so we must also look out not to let him run us aboard for if he has plenty of men that is what he will try to do and it will be his best chance too though i doubt not that we shall beat them off no matter how many there are no doubt about that sir whether they are americans spaniards or negroes answered needham in a confident tone nearly half an hour passed and the relative positions of the vessels were not changed at length the slaver's crew mustering up courage more sail was made on her and she came edging down boldly towards the brig of war now see what long tom can do cried jack he had not miscalculated the distance this time needham pulled the trigger and the shot was seen to strike the stranger's bulwarks she fired in return but without effect long tom was quickly loaded two shots crashed into the slaver and three went over her she replied with a broadside of four guns but one shot only struck the supplejack knocking away one of the after stanchions jack now ordered more sail to be set and shooting across the bows of the enemy his two carronades and long tom were fired simultaneously this raking fire threw the slaver's crew into considerable confusion and before they had recovered from it he again kept away in the meantime the two schooners ranged up on the larboard quarter of the enemy had begun blazing away with their pop-guns thus far jack had evidently the best of it and he would have been wise had he kept at a distance and fired away with long tom the slaver's crew encouraged by their officers returned to their guns and began blazing away with far greater effect than at first but as they fired high no one on deck was hurt their shot began to inflict considerable damage on the rigging and at length the slings of the fore topsail yard being shot away down came the topsail while the other headsails were completely riddled in vain needham did his best to retaliate on the enemy jack saw him binding a handkerchief round his arm though still working his gun three other men were wounded by shot or splinters and one poor fellow sank on the deck to rise no more matters were indeed looking somewhat serious just then the slaver put up her helm jack saw what she was about but was unable to avoid her repel boarders he sang out and in another minute the bows of the black brig crashed against the side of the supplejack the flukes of the enemy's anchors catching in the fore-rigging of the latter 
her crew however had just time to fire their carronades sending several of the enemy to their last account when nearly thirty fierce-looking ruffians with cutlass in hand came crowding to the bows of the brig ready to spring on board jack and most of his people ran forward to repel them the spanish captain fought bravely although driven back again leading on his men he made another desperate effort to get on board the supplejack bevan and the master in the meantime were not idle but as they could bring one of their guns to bear without running the risk of hitting the supplejack they kept firing into the enemy the effect of their fire was to lessen the number of the boarders several of the slavers crew being occupied in working their after guns with the object of keeping the two schooners at bay mctavish and the purser had however managed to run out one of the carronades from the aftermost port of the supplejack and having loaded it with grape fired it directly at the men working at the guns had it been at a greater distance it might have done more damage as it was it hit one of the spaniards blowing him almost to atoms and wounding two others well done cried mctavish whose highland blood was up we'll give them another dose the gun was run in and loaded as before the spaniards who had deserted their gun at the first discharge of the carronade now returned to it and brought it to bear on the supplejack the boarding party were in the meantime making desperate efforts to gain her decks but were met by that determined courage which british seamen never failed to exhibit his brave crew well led by jack and the boatswain every time the spaniards attempted to gain a footing on the forecastle of the english brig those who succeeded were cut down while the rest were driven back now my lads follow me and we'll board them cried jack his proposal was replied to with a loud cheer and he and needham were on the point of leaping on to the brig's forecastle when a shout from aft made him turn his head and he caught sight of don lopez and seven or eight of his companions who had just made their way on deck by the companion hatch the don had a musket in his hand with which he was fiercely attacking the surgeon who had however the moment before seized one and was warding off the blows aimed at him jack singing out to needham to defend the forecastle sprang aft with several of his men to the assistance of mctavish just then the bows of the slaver separated from the supplejack and at the same moment one of the officers of the former who had been looking eagerly to windward shouted to the captain he instantly ran aft to the helm which had been deserted but instead of attempting to regain his former position put it up and allowing his vessel to shoot ahead as soon as she had gathered way went about and stood off to the northward don lopez and his companions seeing themselves deserted threw down their arms and hurried below again as fast as they had come up needham's first impulse was to rush back to long tom with which he began to pepper the retreating slaver as rapidly as the gun could be loaded while the two carronades were worked with equal quickness End of chapter eighteen part one